Uh, hiya, uh, my name's Stuart Johnson um, from West Wormley Farm. Um, JRG Johnson, uh, farming in partnership with my brother and mother and father. Um, we farm 540 acres here at West Wormley. Um, mainly sandy, gravelly type light land, uh, although we do have a bit of heavy ground up on the top. Uh, our unfair advantage will be having quite light soils here, uh, which is good for wintering on. We are based in uh, Northumberland in the Tyne Valley near Hexham. Um, we have about 170 calving cattle um, along with followers, so somewhere between three to 400 head of cattle per year um, and about 800 breeding sheep. Um, we do have a couple of other locations that we use, my brother's farm just up the road and uh, my uncle's farm, uh, which is up the valley. Um, but we're pre predominantly 540 acres here with with the, with the majority of the stock here. Uh, we are predominantly um, sheep and beef here, um, although we do grow a bit of arable. The arable is mainly for home use. My brother enjoys the sheep more than I do, so I'd like to think of myself as the cattle man. Um, and we try and sort of sell the calves at six months old straight off the cow. Um, so we're just running cows through the winter. Um, we don't tend to feed a lot of cattle or, or finish a lot, but that might change going forward, depending on how far we can push the regenerative forage finishing. We probably started about 10 years ago, but it was mainly with the arable side of things. So um, we moved to a strip tillage and, uh, and shallow plow systems to try and avoid disturbing the soil as much. Um, we uh, experimented with that for a few years, about 2017, sort of got to the point where we'd had a bit of success and quite a bit of failure. So we were trying to figure out why. Um, we found that it tended to be the healthier soils could manage the reduced inputs better. So um, having acquired this little bit of knowledge, we decided that we had to understand more and understand why, why it was and wasn't working or we needed to sort of pack in and go back to the conventional system. So we went full hog, um, went full no-till with the arable about 2017 and then Really, if I'm being honest with you, I didn't realise that you could do much with the, the livestock side of things till that sort of 2017, 2018 when we started trying to educate ourselves and, um, and realised there was a whole different method of grazing livestock, um, mob grazing, um, moving cattle every day, moving sheep every day. Uh, it, it was slightly more intensive but work-wise, but the results are so staggering that it, we wouldn't go back to the old system now. Um, currently using a, a five and two system where we do five years of legume and herbage swards, um, mob grazing livestock over it properly, um, high density when possible and when it suits the ground, suits the context. Um, and then we can sort of draw out two years of arable with very little inputs at all, um, which, which makes a huge difference. When we were trying the, 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 the low input slash uh, reduced tillage in soils that weren't healthy. It just didn't seem to work. Um, so once we understood, understood the link between organic matter of the soils and the, the soil's sort of biological activity, we were able to sort of understand where and when it would work to use a, a, a no-till cereal crop in there. So by building up those, those years of mob grazing and increasing the biological activity, we're able to then utilize that with a, with a two year sort of arable crops, which is, like I say, getting virtually little to no inputs at all. Um, so that's the, the, the real benefits of the relationship where we can utilize the livestock to build that fertility up. And then sort of, I, t I tend to tell people it's like building up a bank account. We'll build up a bank account for five years and then we cash a little bit out. So we might spend the interest, but then we, we go back to building that bank account back up again straight after that. So. Um, we went about making changes purely for the financial reasons. Uh, had zero or very little interest in the, the, the beneficial to the wildlife and the environment. Um, purely to begin with, it was all about the, uh, the financials of trying to save costs and input costs. Um, it's only when you sort of get a few years in or you increase your knowledge that you realize that that, that only comes with the with a, with a functioning ecosystem. So all of a sudden it gets flipped on its head where the financial is the benefits that comes by creating the environment where the biology and everything's working. So um, having started with the financials, we now sort of look at the, the soil and the, the plants and the diversity to make sure that we've got a functioning ecosystem, which then creates those 
financial benefits that we all want. Uh, we used to grow somewhere in the region of 150 to 200 acres of arable, um, depending on the year and depending on what, what the rotations felt like. Um, since we've changed the system though, we're not actually keeping livestock in as long, so we don't need the straw. Um, we're actually feeding a lot less grain, so we've, we've actually cut down the home use cereals to about 70 acres now. Um, we rotate that uh, in a five and two, um, five years legume and herbs, and then two years of, two years of arable. The cereals we grow is barley. Um, we grew a bit of wheat last year because, like I say, we're not using very much, so we're toyed with growing something to sell. But um, we're just going back to full barley again now. We'll uh, we'll sort of use maybe 40% of the fertilizer we used years ago, um, five years ago, six years ago. Um, somewhere in the region, we used to use somewhere in the region on the grassland and arable together, somewhere between 70 and 90 tons of fertilizer a year. Um, and the last two years we've used less than 10 and that's only going on the arable ground now. Um, sprays wise, we've cut out all fungicides, um, all insecticides, um, and we put a bit of herbicide on when the crop gets going just to make sure that the way we graze the swords, we try and create a huge seed bank as we go. Um, so that seed bank can impact on the cereal crop if we don't manage it for that first sort of month as the cereal crop's coming away. So we will, uh, we will manage that seed bank a little bit just to make sure that the crop gets a chance to establish. Uh, with the results with the cereals wise, um, like I say, we've reduced the, the, the chemical um, applications substantially, um, reduced the fertilizer by sort of 60% so far. So we're, we're, we're aiming to go further. Um, it's just building that bank account up to allow us to do that. One of the key things we're doing now is putting uh, legume and herbage swords in here. Um, working on a ratio of about 65% grass, 20% herbs and 15% legumes. Um, that is to try and get the right um, carbon to nitrogen ratio, um, which then hopefully feeds the right carbon to nitrogen ratio into the cattle to allow them to thrive. Um, what we do is we try to tend to rest for somewhere between 50 to sometimes it's, we've had 11, 11 month rest last year, but usually sort of 50 to 100 days is what we're looking for. Um, especially the first year or two, I like to try and get all of the, let the plants seed. So we're trying to lay that seed bank down, build that seed bank back up again, which has probably been uh, abused over the last 15, 20 years. So we're trying to lay those seeds back down. Um, what we'll do is we'll bring the cows in. We usually work on 12 to 24 hour graze periods. Um, so we'll, we'll bring them in at a, a, kind, a, a relatively high density, um, get them in there, get it done, they'll graze half um, and hopefully they'll trample down the other half and then we'll just ship them off and then give them that big long rest period. Those big long rest periods allow these plants to, to bounce back quick, let the roots sort of sink themselves in uh, and hopefully set that, set in the motion the sort of biological um, uh, communication between the plant and the microbiology. Um, they'll pump those extradates down sink that carbon but also at the same time feed those seed those microbes who in return give the plant what they need so um, but you can't do that without these big long rest periods and these big roots um, so we find that that's sort of the crucial bit is to try and to try and let them let them let them rest but then hit them hard for a very short period of time and that seems to be what's building the fertility back up in the soils so yeah so the fertilizer like I said before we used to use somewhere in the region of 70 to 90 90 tons a year. Um, the last two years we've used less than 10 tons. Um, we we use um, farm lard manure, um, which we've uh, which we use when we withdraw something from a field. Say we take a crop of hay or silage off, we will then put a bit of manure on to lay that back down. Um, but generally, that's all home saved. Um, feed wise, um, we now can winter the cattle. We outwinter the cattle. It used to be sort of November they would come in, but they stayed out till middle of January last year we bring them into calve in February and then we start turning them in out again in March um, so we don't house the cattle very long so we tend to just feed home safe forage now and we're not buying a lot of feed for cattle anymore um, sheep wise we've now gone two years without buying any supplementary feed here at Warmley um, we're just feeding on these legume and herb rich swords um, mob grazing the sheep every day I think there was a mob of 600 last year in one batch uh, shift them every day and then um, 
we seem to be getting through without any supplementary feed uh, for them either which is good um, there is the odd batch that gets a little bit when they've got triplets or the lean but if the something doesn't quite suit our system we then uh, we then remove it from the system sell it on um, so uh, we are in the process of sort of changing the the breeds of the sheep and the cattle to sort of suit the system better um, what we did was we tried to back in 2018 when we started looking at what was working and what wasn't working we had a bit of a we probably had a bit of a problem where we were trying to impose our own system and our own beliefs on the environment a bit too much um, picking a breed we wanted to do whether it suited the system or not so over the last sort of five years we've sort of gone full circle and we've kind of tried to plan what we think the farm can manage alongside the environment what what would be the best most financially rewarding enterprises um, and within that we've sort of now changing the breeds to suit the environment more and um, we don't want to bring them inside any longer than we have to because that's the expensive bit so we try to leave them out as long as possible um, sadly some cows don't suit that system um, but we'll find out very quickly which ones will and which ones won't and then we'll we'll keep veering more towards the ones that will and and siphoning out the ones that won't um, livestock wise with the sheep we found that um, we used to we used to be all mule bred sheep they don't really suit our system anymore because they can't stay fit enough in the winter on forage and conversely we have a innovus bred sheep now at the minute we're in a transitional period where we've got some mules left and then we've got the innovus ones and we're finding that the the innovus forage bred sheep are getting too fat and the mules are not getting fat enough or keeping fit enough shall i say so um we're going to fast track that transition into the innovus sheep and try and have a bit more of a uniform yow that allows us to to treat them all the same and just make life a little bit easier um, on that front too probably when we started um, back in, ooh, in the early days 2012 to 2015 we focused on or i did focus very heavily on um graham say and joel williams sort of um way of doing it which was the uh, treatment shall we say or applications you're trying to replace in one input which we know is bad for the environment with something that's less harmful and and hopefully less costly and and I think all that's wonderful for people who who either a don't have livestock to bring into the system or don't want livestock or people who who want to mitigate the losses as they do trans transition from conventional to regen um, so I think that's it is important to know that and understand it um, but I think the real progress came sort of 2018 when I came across um, Gabe Brown and Alan Williams, um, Dr. Alan Williams, who are part of Understanding Ag in America. And they are probably light years ahead of most people in terms of um, simplifying the system, making it easy, um, finding, finding ways to treat stuff, but try and make sure it's the last time we have to do it. Um, so I think since that sort of, the last five or six years, since we sort of went heavier down that path i think things have definitely uh, definitely improved far faster um, rather than looking to fix the problem we now ask ourselves why is there a problem in the first place what's caused that and what can we change to to stop that problem coming back um, i think i think there's a lot of people selling a lot of potions and snake oils and stuff out there now which is uh, uh, I'm not saying that they don't work, they will work, but I think there's a bigger picture to it than that. I think you need to understand why there's been a problem in the first place. Because if you put these applications on, which can be quite costly at times, unless you change what you're doing, that problem's going to still be there. So, so what we need to do is sort of ask ourselves why it's happening and what can we do as farmers, what can we do to, to mitigate those problems from coming back again? Um, and I think that's a lot more satisfying way of being on the idea that we might get to a point where we're not applying anything or we're not applying applying band-aids shall we say we are just applying we're just we're just farming in a way that suits the environment and it and it allows us to continue in a, in a very positive cyclical kind of fashion uh, cattle wise we've got about 170 sort of calving cattle we 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 have our own herd of cattle here and we have a flying herd of heifers that we bring in calf and then sell on with calves at foot um, Within our own breeds, we kind of have the, the conventional old types, um, which we're moving away from now as they don't really suit this sort of system anymore. Sort of dairy bred or um, 
or continental bred cattle, um, then they don't tend to suit the system as well anymore. Um, so we are at the minute moving towards more stabiliser cattle, which carry the carry the flesh a lot better. They're a bit smaller, a bit more compact. Um, they don't weigh quite as much. So in the winter, we maybe don't make as much mess on those wet days. Um, and it just allows us to, to keep those cattle outside longer. I mean, we're, I think we're somewhere around the two pound a day per head for the cow in the shed. I mean, everyone's got their own figures, so it'll all be different. But if ours is two pound a day in there, I think we're about a quarter of the cost outside. And that's the bit that sort of, that's the bit that makes you your money, um, especially in a cow herd that's relatively marginal at times anyway. Um, every bit helps. And if we can, if we can reduce that cost, cost per head per day, by keeping them outside while we're benefiting the soil and the plants outside, that's just a win for everything that. So I was intrigued by Soil Farm of the Year um, just to, uh, to understand how we were probably doing compared to a lot of people, to, to share ideas, to understand from other people, to, to, to hear other people's ideas. Um, so I think it's, as a concept, it's a brilliant concept for just uh, stimulating discussion, um, seeing what's going on, um, looking forward to going and seeing the other finalists' farms, um, just to see how they've done, and what they're doing different, what I can pick up from them. Um, in terms of winning, uh, it's a, it's it was it was very, it was very good. Um, not someone who really goes in for competitions, but it was nice to get a pat on the back for something I was interested in, um, something I actually have a real passion towards. So to to get a bit of a, a nod was good for that. Um, Apart from that, it's just a, a, a certificate on the wall and get back to work, I guess. So. Uh, one of the main uh, drivers that we had for making changes was to try and sort of bring resilience back to the farm business. Um, in a conventional system, you're very reliant on inputs, which in turn makes you very reliant on, on price fluctuations or on, or on uh, fertilizer companies or, or the prices that we're getting. Uh, for stock. Um, so what we're trying to do is bring resilience back to our business. Um, doing this is we're taking away all of the need or reliance that we have on all these other external companies. Um, we're trying to place it more back in our own hands. Um, resilience comes with a, with a functioning ecosystem, with a, with a healthy biodiversity. Um, so, so if someone told me I'd be looking for dung beetles and I would be chuffed about it 10 years ago lying, lying in the muck, um, I would have laughed at them, but but what we have found is that if we know we've got the dung beetles, we know that we've got a functioning ecosystem, knows we can we can ride out those dry periods and those wet periods, and that we're gonna we're gonna come through the other side of that with a with a with a strong business and a strong a strong financial model that comes with the, the the resilience in the in the environment. It comes back into the financial side of things as well. Um, so what we do want to see is all these positive things, but at the end of the day, that's that's hopefully as well backing us up financially as well, which is which is the main point of it. You know, we're a business and we need to function. So um, that resilience comes in many forms, but it's it's it needs to it needs to go through the whole business.